Welcome everyone to the Alden House Historic Sites presentation of the Mayflower, Myths and Mysteries. My name is Desiree Mobed and I'm the Executive Director. Together with the Alden Kindred of America and our Board of Directors, we preserve and share the legacy of Mayflower passengers John and Priscilla Alden and their homestead in Duxbury, Massachusetts. During this 400th anniversary year of the Mayflower voyage, with so many travel plans canceled, we are delighted to be able to take you on a virtual tour of England to explore a tale of two Mayflower ships and their secrets and the places connected with the Pilgrim story. Our speaker is Randall Charlton, author and son of Englishman Warwick Charlton, who built Mayflower II as a gift to America. I wanna thank the sites and museums and um, places in England for sharing their stories and to Randall's sister Vicki and Dick Stone of Mayflower Event News for helping make this presentation possible. After Randall finishes his talk, we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into the question and answer function on your screen. If you have to leave early or you'd like to share this program with others later, we will be posting it on the Alden website. And now, from across the pond, we welcome Randall Charlton. Well, thank you very much, Desiree, and um, welcome everyone wherever you are. Uh, I, it's a pleasure to give my third talk to the Friends of Alden House, and I'm sorry I can't be with you, but um, I hope to take you on a tour um, of England today, which will uh, show some light on the Mayflower myths and mysteries, but also something that I think is quite important in that uh, over the last um, several years, a large number of uh, towns, villages, and uh, churches, museums have been preparing to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the first settlers arriving on Mayflower. And um, obviously, uh, they're disappointed because right now, due to the health crisis, uh, there are very few tourists arriving and um, some of the uh, venues are shut. But they will still be there uh, whenever you can come in 2021 or wherever uh, to welcome you. And what I'd like to do is take you on a personal tour. Um, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not a, um, uh, a registered guide, uh, nor am I, um, no one's ever accused me of having academic excellence, so I'm not a great historian. So this is my personal view of what you might find really interesting. And what I'd like to do now, first of all, is ask you to get on your imaginary plane, your train, um, your... Um, whatever transport you use and come to meet me um, not far away from where I'm talking to you right now in the village of Dorking which is just um, to the south of London and I'd like you to go to a little cafe um, uh, on um, 58 West Street and here I'm introducing you to um, Susan and Basil who are the owners of the cafe. And in addition to the most fabulous cakes um, and tea and coffee, they also have a great knowledge of uh, the Mayflower story. Um, and, and, more, and in more detail, um, uh, the Alden story. Why? Because this is Mullins Cafe. Um, it's the original home of William Mullins and his wife and children before they left um, for uh, America on the first Mayflower. 
And what I'd like to do, we're going to have a bit of a whirlwind tour. If we just hang on to that picture um, for a second in the cafe, because I haven't finished my tea yet. Um, I want to tell you um, what, what I'm going to try and do, because you're going to do a lot of traveling. So um, we're not going to be still for long. We're going to be virtually um, whizzing around the country. First of all, I'd like to uh, take a look at uh, the, um, the strangers the not, that went on the original Mayflower. The folks that uh, were not going and exploring the new world for religious uh, reasons, uh, to get away from religious persecution. Because those strangers has, had an important role in both the financing and the early settlement of America. Then we're going to go and take a look at the real beating heart of the religious revolt um, and visit some of the churches. Then take a look at how those religious dissidents who wanted to worship as they saw fit um, sought refuge elsewhere. And we're going to look at some of their escape routes. Then we're going to go back to London, or back to the South anyway, and um, examine the home of Christopher Jones, the captain of, of the Mayflower. And then finally, I want to take you on uh, the tour, if you will, that uh, Mayflower took from London um, down to Plymouth before it then set out for the New World. Okay, so let's uh, start with um, going to Dorking Museum. You only have to walk about 100 yards, if that, and you've got there already. Um, the, 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 if you just go back to that cockerel there for a second, um, uh, it's worth mentioning that Dorking Museum was famous um, since Roman times uh, for um, its um, wonderful poultry. Um, and it, it's the emblem of this beautiful uh, town in, in the Surrey countryside. And um, among other things, the, the cockerels, for some reason, had um, uh, five, five fingers to their, to their feet. So once in the museum, you're going to see, um, uh, if you go to the next slide, please, a frieze which is called the Procession of Ancestors. And um, it's a beautiful depiction of the marriage, of the imaginary marriage of Priscilla Alden, uh, Priscilla uh, Mullins to John Alden. And in that picture, they've accumulated all the ancestors going back to um, uh, early times. Now, um, there are, if you need to learn more about that, I encourage you to read a book um, by Kathy Alderton um, of Dorking Museum, uh, which um, sets out um, the history in some detail. But one thing I will say is that there's a little bit of a myth about the origin of uh, William Mullins. Some of you who um, may think you, your um, ancestry goes all the way back to uh, the stout English heritage, uh, may be surprised to know that um, uh, the family uh, that uh, commissioned this picture uh, believe that William Mullins actually uh, came from a family of French dissidents. So you may have a little more ooh -la, la in your uh, bloodlines than you think, but I leave that to um, genealogists to, um, uh, to confirm way, one way or another. The museum um, has some lovely exhibits about the Mayflower, and we'll look at one in which um, my wife um, is being given a very severe look by a image of William Mullins, you see on the left with his hand on the cap. Um, there's dressing up um, uh, costume. And my wife um, thought she'd see how she might look in um, uh, 
Priscilla Mullins's um, uh, costume of the time. Okay, so we've had a quick look at, at the strangers and in passing before we leave Dorking, um, I'd like to just mention that there are other strangers that um, came from Dorking, uh, including um, Peter Brown and uh, Robert Carter, who was William Mullins' um, manservant. Okay, so take a look at this map, if you will. Um, you'll see London is number 10, um, down towards the bottom um, of, of the country. And I, I want you to get on a train now with me. Um, it's a fast train, so don't worry, we're gonna be there in one second. But normally, if you do it in real time, it's still only 90 minutes. And we're going to go up to a small market town where you see the word, uh, the letter three and two hidden behind it, um, uh, the town of Redford. So let's get the train journey going. We're there already. That's marvelous, isn't it? Modern science. Here we are in Redford. And Redford's fascinating because when you go to it, it's a relatively small market town surrounded in beautiful countryside by small villages. And I think as we explore it here on this map, uh, we'll see one by one some of um, the homes of the real leaders of the Puritan movement. But we thought, before we go to their homes, Let's drop in on a brand new museum um, uh, called Bassett Law Museum in the center of Redford. And here we've got a, a pilgrim welcome. And um, as we look around the museum and go to the next um, room, we see what I found to be a really impressive uh, layout and a storyboard which tells you the background to all the main leaders, um, whether it was uh, Br Brewster or Bradford, names you I'm sure you're familiar with, or John Robinson, one of the powerful speakers, or Robert Clifton, an an another uh, speaker. This, uh, this museum um, opened in 2019 and you know is ready for um, a crowd of um, Mayflower enthusiasts and there's a couple of things which I think you'll find exciting. One of them is a story chair where you sit on the chair and you can hear an angry King James railing on about these religious dissidents who won't worship in the way that I want them to, to, um, to worship. As well as you can hear children um, and um, uh, one of the uh, female um, uh, Mayflower travelers talk about the experience uh, of um, the whole expedition uh, as a woman. So it's, that's really fascinating. Then um, if you go, if you look through to the room where there's a storyboard, you'll see a tiny image, uh, which you can barely see right now, but here's a close up of it. Um, among the interesting things that that museum um, uh, highlights is uh, the uh, involvement of business and industry in sort of cloaking themselves in um, the clothes and the brand of Mayflower because, you know, Mayflower, strangely enough, although it's a story of, of great drama and a lot of disappointment and tragedy, is seen, I think, by people on both sides of the Atlantic as a really uplifting tale. And here's an early picture of uh, Huntley and Palmer's biscuits. Um, now, Let's go out into the countryside. Um, well, before we do that, um, this, is, this is something that really got to me. This is um, uh, 
Sandra Withington, who is responsible for this whole museum, and she and her staff have just done a magnificent job. And um, I'm there um, uh, poised, looking into a mirror. Now this mirror is something else. I've been to a few museums in the world, but this really shocked me. Um, I was looking to see how much hair I'd lost, and instead of um, getting my ugly mug uh, back um, in the image, uh, out came uh, an image of William Brewster, a hologram. And he starts talking about um, what led them to, as a, as a group in this area, to become dissatisfied with the way they were asked to worship. Um, and he takes you through the story. And I listened to a couple of his, you know, minutes of his talk and he fades into the background again. So I turned to go to the rest of the museum and then there was <coughs> a cough and I turned around and it was the hologram who came out to talk to me some more. And it, it sort of brought the whole experience to life for me. So uh, congratulations um, to um, Bassett Law and Retford for producing this museum. And what they do also is give you now a guided tour of the villages of the area. So you can get an application and you've got a self-guided tour and in half a day, and we're going to do it in half a minute probably, we can go round and look at some of the churches where the first passionate advocates for the separation of um, the government from the individual's right to worship as they saw fit was given voice to. And let's start off with um, Bad Badworth where a, um, a pastor called Richard Clifton um, um, began uh, upsetting uh, the king's men with some of his ideas and uh, to the point where eventually he was thrown out of his parish, his living. It's a beautiful church, by the way, as all of them are in this area. And I'm only showing you the outside now because we haven't got time, we've got so much to see. But when you come, I urge you to go inside and have a look at some of the stained glass windows. Let's go on to the next church, uh, which is certainly Steeple. Steeple. And this was where Pastor John Robinson uh, preached. And it's, again, it's not far away. Um, it's in this little area. And um, this, is, this church is particularly well known for the quality of its stained glass windows. And although Pastor Robinson didn't go on the Plymouth journey, um, he was very, very in influential. Now, Austerfield, again to the north in South Yorkshire, just over the border, was the birthplace of your first governor, Governor Bradford. Um, and he and um, uh, another of that congregation uh, were fined, um, which was the f at one point, which was one of the first signs. It was in the early 1600s, I think it was about 1604. And um, they got the idea that, um, uh, that more, um, uh, more would come from, uh, from London to stop them worshiping, worshiping as they saw foot. So, and we go to the next slide. And this is Scrooby. All these churches look different, but they're quite beautiful, I think. And this was where uh, William Brewster uh, uh, worshipped. Um, now, we could stay all day, and some people do. They take a full day to do this tour, but uh, we've got to get on our journey. So back to this uh, map. And if you look to the right, you'll see um, a lady in a um, blue um, coat and white hat. And just above her to the left is the town of Gainsborough, across the other side of the River Trent. And this 
is where the separatists, the so-called Puritans, saints, what you will, um, had a really good friend. And let's take a look, let's go the short distance there to see the Great Hall in Gainsborough. And it really is great. It's recognized as being one of the most um, impressive buildings of that age. And it was um, the property of Sir William Hickman um, and his wife Rose. And they were supporters of the, the uh, Protestant and the separatist movement. And they allowed them to worship there in, um, in, in secret from, I think it was about uh, 1604 onwards before things got so hot um, that they had to leave. But let's take another look at um, another building in Gainsborough. Um, and this was the old post office, which is now a uh, Gainsborough Heritage Museum. And it's a bit like um, a lot of the smaller museums you'll find in England. You really feel you're going into someone's home. I mean, what I loved when I walked in there the first time, I was directed to the tea room and I had, you know, a cup of tea and a lovely piece of cake and people were sitting down talking to me. They didn't know, you know, uh, anything about me other than I was interested in, in the history of Gainsborough, which has a really rich history um, over the years, including, um, which I found particularly interesting because I have a little bit of an agricultural background. It was the, a hive of innovation at the centre uh, during the agricultural revolution of, of the 1800s. Um, and, um, I think my father, Warwick Charlton, would have been delighted to know that uh, my sister, who you'll see here, together with Andy um, and Lynn Marie Burkett, who um, are um, running uh, the museum with their great team, um, agreed to put on the first ever exhibit of uh, my father's um, gift to the American people of Mayflower II in 1957. So when you come over, you'll be able to see all the background, um, how a man of modest means, um, uh, with no experience in sailing, um, but um, a, a, a love of America, um, decided to build um, a replica uh, and he succeeded. He found um, a captain, he found a crew. Before that, he, he figured out the design and, and, and identified a builder, and he raised the money. And in this exhibit, you'll see um, the various ways in which um, he got the support of the media. For example, you'll see um, uh, the National Geographic, as well as produced a range of souvenirs, which he sold to raise money to pay the ever-increasing shipbuilding uh, bill. And, um, and then um, he went to industry, and in this medallion, which I think is quite beautiful, that he produced um, at the time, uh, you'll see um, the sailors um, loading um, a treasure chest. And one of the ways that my father financed um, the building of Mayflower II was to invite industry and over 90 companies stepped up to um, meet his request uh, to pay 460 pounds, I think it was, um, to, um, uh, to take a, a treasure chest, which was put in Mayflower II, and then when Mayflower II arrived in Plymouth in June 1957, uh, it, uh, the, the, the Mayflower Transit Company of America picked up these treasure chests and, and took them 
uh, around the country where they were exhibited in New York um, and uh, Chicago and the, uh, and, and the other major cities of America. And um, so that there was a lot of corporate support for my father's adventure. Uh, there was also, as you can see from this other exhibit, um, a, a great deal of political interest. And um, uh, my father was quite good friends with Randolph Churchill and had met briefly Winston Churchill during the war. And uh, you'll see the picture of him ahead of Nelson and Walter Raleigh um, uh, waving Mayflower off. So um, there was uh, political support, although at the high level of government, there was suspicion that the Brits were sending the wrong image to America in uh, the 1950s and that, um, you know, some people thought it was a bad idea. Uh, they thought we should be showing the best of our technology. Um, but those of you who have seen Mayflower know that, Mayflower 2 know, knows that it touches a nerve uh, with everybody that comes um, in, uh, to see it. So let's look at a couple of other exhibits and there are many more which I encourage you to spend some time at Gainsborough Museum. On the left, although you can't read it, um, uh, is the sail um, because my father actually sold the ship to Plymouth Plantation. Um, uh, and on the right is the telegram when he sent, when it was formally handed over on Thanksgiving Day, 1957. Um, if we look closely at the bill of sale, you'll see what that ship, which has recently been refurbished for over a million dollars, was sold to Plymouth Plantation for. It was one dollar. One dollar. Just think about it. Here's, my, here's a man who had um, uh, no house, no car, no savings, um, lived paycheck to paycheck. In three years, he raised the money uh, to build a ship, sailed it to America, and gave it to the American people for a dollar. He was passionate about um, uh, America because he'd seen firsthand American support during the Second World War. And he, was, he served on Mon General Montgomery's staff, so he met a, top, a few top-level um, emissaries of President Roosevelt. And after the war, he said, you know, uh, it could have gone a very different way if America had not jumped in early to support freedom and democracy. And that's why he built the ship. Okay, so we're making headway on our tour. Uh, this is a, a, a shop uh, close to Church Street um, where you can get antiques. But I'm sorry to tell you all, you can't stop because we're in a bit of a hurry. We've got a lot more to see before we're done. Now, if you look at that map of England, we have been where the numbers two and three are. And you look down at four and five. That's where we're going next before going down to nine and then back to London. So we've got a lot of traveling to do. Whoa, we're in jail in no time at all. Isn't that wonderful? Well, um, uh, uh, Miss Judd, Leslie Judd, the, um, uh, the uh, movie star, um, who I think claims ancestry to see the Bradford or Brewster, I'm not sure, but she recently visited these jails where in 1607 um, the first um, uh, uh, attempt to flee the country was made. They were caught in Boston and ended up in, in that jail. And um, they tried again in 1608. Uh, walking the long way to the port of Immingham. And here you will see a um, uh, memorial to the adventure. And again, there was great drama. Uh, there were no arrests made, as I understand it. 
a lot of the men got on the boat and made off for um, Holland, that the, the boat that they had uh, commissioned. Um, and a, a lot of the, the women and children were left on the shore and had to join later. But that basically signaled uh, the move uh, towards Holland, where they stayed, as you know, for several years uh, before deciding they wanted to go to England um, to commission a ship, which turned out to be the Mayflower. And here, down in Harwich, that's another new exhibit for you when you come over. Uh, that is the picture of Captain uh, Christopher Jones who owns um, the Mayflower. And Harwich, by the way, has this wonderful um, background in, in seafaring. Uh, this is Christopher Jones's house on, on the left, which has never been open to the public until this year, as I understand it. Um, and um, nearby that, um, is the church where Christopher Jones was baptized uh, and, and twice married. Uh, but he, he also um, worked out of London, um, which we've got to go back to now in order to uh, get on the final journey. Um, now you see London there, Southampton, Dartmouth and Plymouth. Uh, Christopher Jones um, uh, lived in London in, a, in, a, in the uh, town of, or the district of Rotherhithe where there is um, a lovely pub. This is an old picture of um, the Spread Eagle pub, um, which he is rumored, and I'm not quite sure what that means, but uh, I guess it means it's not quite proven, but it's believed that he bought a share in the pub so that he could tie his ship up because the, the pub, uh, borders on um, the river um, and he could claim uh, that it was where he lived and he wouldn't for some reason that made him exempt from the king's taxes but that's where he probably drank along with some of the crew of the original Mayflower who were uh, in um, uh, uh, nearby Bermondsey and the first part of the journey, so the Mayflower actually left from Rotherhide and London. It then stopped to meet the Speedwell, bearing the, uh, many of the pilgrims that had come back from um, uh, Holland in, in the town of Southampton, where uh, both the saints and the strangers um, uh, boarded. And, um, the picture before uh, this last one, if we could just go back to that for a second, shows my father in the dress of Miles Standage. When he was building Mayflower II, he wanted to do everything as historically correct as possible. And he, he got into the history of it and he decided that he wanted to be Miles Standish. And Miles Standish, um, comes from another place that you might think of visiting, Chorley in Lancashire. Um, and he was born and, and reared in uh, a, re a region of Chorley, uh, an area of Chorley, which will not, it won't, won't come as a surprise to you know, to know that it was called Duxbury. Where did that name come from, I wonder? And uh, Warwick, on reading about um, uh, Standish, was convinced that he was a man of many skills. Um, he knew a bit about agriculture. He was a bit of a soldier. Um, he was someone who could protect the more ascetic uh, religious uh, leaders who were men of books and learning. So let's go back to Southampton and we see uh, the 102 passengers um, setting out um, uh, uh, to board the ship. Um, some of them were on, of course, um, at London. Um, uh, and I believe it's, it's felt that um, William Mullins and other strangers and so forth, uh, so forth were 
uh, already on the ship, and it was the religious people mostly that joined the ship in Southampton. Then we went on um, to another really beautiful town, which is worth visiting if you, whether you have an interest in Mayflower or not, um, Dartmouth, where the Mayflower had to put in because uh, Speedwell in particular, um, was two ships were originally going to make this journey, um, uh, was, it was leaking badly. And you will find a really well-managed museum uh, with a lot to interest you at Dartmouth, uh, including an absolutely beautiful um, uh, replica of the Mayflower, which uh, you will see here is a work in progress, but you'll, when you come over, you'll be able to see um, the full ship. And then finally, we go to Plymouth, which is known as, I think, um, uh, as um, England's gateway to uh, the ocean, it's the ocean seaport, um, and as a, you know, years of connections with um, seafaring, and this is where the pilgrims finally left from. Um, you'll see me there um, pointing to uh, the Mayflower 1620 message in the concrete. And this is the gateway uh, uh, that uh, the Plymouth steps that they, uh, Mayflower steps that they went down. I always think it's a little bit larger than it ought to be because, um, you know, in those days people were uh, not much over five foot tall, many of them. Um, and certainly when they got on the boat, there were cramped conditions. The middle decks where they were between decks was. I think it was something like five foot four space, so very cramped conditions. But they will have felt they were going through a, um, uh, a very large um, space as they set out down those steps on the other side to board the ship. And there's another exciting new surprise for you in Plymouth when you get there, um, the Box Museum which is as modern in design as uh, you can make it. And um, uh, it's got some really exciting uh, material um, uh, on the whole Mayflower Anglo-American culture, including uh, a lot of material on Native American Indians. Um, uh, and um, it, one of the things I'm really proud about is that the Charlton Foundation provided a modest level of support for uh, um, uh, Dr. Helen Chamberlain to go across to Plymouth last year um, as part of the work that the museum are doing to um, produce a really stunning educational exhibit, including an educational film uh, which is being shown um, to um, English school children. So, uh, we've got to get back to Greenwich now for your plane home. Um, we haven't got long to spare, but I don't want you to go without going to this incredible um, group of museums. It's, it's more than one. Uh, this is Greenwich uh, Naval Observatory and Museum um, it's, uh, in, in London. And you can see the Thames through the middle and the city of London. And I mention this um, uh, in, in part because this is where my father started when he decided to research um, the design of the original Mayflower because um, he went over and met um, the head of the museum's naval researcher, Dr. R.C. Anderson, and um, uh, he got introductions to um, uh, Plymouth Plantation um, uh, and others uh, that were incredibly helpful to him, including uh, the, his, who, the man who would become his captain, Alan Villiers. So spend a day there um, before you get on your plane, I urge you. And then um, I don't want you to go without having a drink. Um, 
I'm, I'm sorry I didn't offer you a cup of tea earlier when um, we arrived. Uh, it few, feels like only a few minutes ago um, back in Dorking. Um, but this is the, the current Mayflower pub and it has a very interesting history. Um, in addition to being the one where Christopher Jones drank, um, I understand that um, Queen Elizabeth's sister, um, uh, Margaret, um, met um, Sir Anthony, uh, Armstrong, uh, Anthony Armstrong Jones, who later became Lord Snowden and married her. Um, and I understand they spent a lot of time in this pub before their romance became public and they married. So that would be a nice place to have a drink. And all I can offer you at the moment is a, vir a virtual drink. Um, it's a glass of cider, which a Devonshire um, uh, cider company, a family cider company called Courtney's of Wimple in Devon. Um, they have produced um, and are producing this year um, Wicked Pilgrim Cider. Um, to celebrate um, uh, Mayflower 2 and um, you know I felt quite honored that they wanted to add the publication of my book The Wicked Pilgrim um, and you'll find that on the label somewhere uh, the true story of the Englishman who gave Mayflower to, to America so with that I hope you're not too tired um, and I'd like to thank all the various um, people that have helped in this um, short um, tour. And I hope you've got a really good taste of what I, um, what I found um, uh, and have found. And that is, there are multiple stories. There's the really important Dorking story, which is the heart of the, the strangers who provided a lot of the financial and business incentives to make um, America um, uh, um, and the trip over, you know, over the long run successful. Then the religious heart, which is actually in that tiny area up north, although there were separatists from other parts of uh, London, uh, England. And then finally, the journey from London um, to Southampton, then Dartmouth and Plymouth. Um, so a lot of places um, can claim in England um, uh, to have a connection to Mayflower. I think there's an old saying, um, and uh, I'm going to paraphrase it, that um, uh, defeat is an orphan, victory has a hundred fathers. Um, I can assure you the story of Mayflower in England um, is not regarded um, uh, uh, as defeat, even though we eventually lost the colony. Um, but um, it's a great victory because over the years, they let the bonds between America and, uh, and Britain have been, uh, remained strong. And, you know, my father's love of, um, uh, America has been replicated and um, uh, we've now got, um, uh, perhaps I can end by saying, a connection with Alden which um, we really cherish and that is that we're going to have some scholarships for um, uh, an Alden House um, uh, students to um, to pursue their education. So thank you. Randall, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. It's hard to pick a favorite spot, although from the Alden House, we always have a special spot in our heart for Dorking and the Mullins Cafe. So hello to Susan and Basil out there. Um, we do have several questions and comments that are coming in, Randall. So um, I'd like to go ahead and start sharing um, that with you. And um, Dick, who's actually handling the slides, 
Uh, we have a special request for that first map again. So maybe if you wanna uh, go ahead and um, find that slide, we can post it. But as far as the questions, and this is a tough one, um, Randall, because I can't help you at all. <laughs> um, has the replica of the Speedwell ever been made? Not to my knowledge. Um, no, it hasn't. Um, and um, in some ways it's not surprising because it was a very leaky ship. Uh, <laughs> they tried several times uh, to repair it. First, uh, they had a go in Southampton, then they had another go in um, Dartmouth before at Plymouth, you know, it was, they finally said, look, it just can't make it across the Atlantic. Um, and it was abandoned. So I think it's better left um, uh, unbuilt. <laughs> that would be my judgment um, uh, or thought. Um, one thing I did want to add to everyone is I've mentioned an awful lot of places in a very quick time. Um, I, I'm going to um, let um, Desiree have um, a list of websites and and other uh, things that um, you might be interested in looking at. You know, for example, anyone who hasn't gone to um, Mayflower 400 UK, I absolutely uh, urge you to start there. Uh, there's also a, a raft of other sites um, with um, specific information on individual towns, villages, museums, and so on. And I'll supply that. And so if anybody sends an email to you, uh, Desiree, if you could let them have that information. Uh, we'd uh, be happy to that. share that. Yeah. yeah. And and that, in <laughs> that includes, by the way, professional guides um, uh, and, and some very good ones who are anxious to offer tours um, um, to, um, uh, to you know, parties or individuals. That's wonderful. Thank you. So you all be looking for that and we will post that as well. So here's a question and this is one of those um, moments I'm sure you would all have loved to have been the fly on the wall. Um, uh, people looking for passenger lists for the Speedwell and the Mayflower um, when you know they still when they still expected the speed the speedwell to be speedy and seaworthy, um, so someone's just you know trying to do research on that. And my knowledge is that there weren't lists kept, and it had to be interesting in terms of how they sorted out who was going to get on the Mayflower. But what do, what information do you have to add to that? Well, I would encourage. Um, uh, our, uh, our viewers um, to go to one or two other sites. Um, one is, um, if I can mention, Voyaging Through History, and it'll be on my list that I give to you. This is um, uh, an academic um, group uh, based in Exeter and the University of Belfast, um, which has government support which is studying all aspects of um, the Mayflower story through history. Uh, so please check them out because there's some wonderful talks. Um, and there's also, as I'm sure many of you who um, have studied the Mayflower story will be familiar with the name uh, Dr. Jeremy Bangs. Um, and you know, one mustn't forget um, uh, the Nathaniel Philbrick uh, book on, on the original Mayflower. Uh, on, you will also find information, believe it or not, there's quite a lot on various bits of the website, including Pinterest, um, Mayflower 400, uh, will have information as well. Um, I, I find it interesting that the, uh, the original merchant venturers, when they were putting the agreement to finance the two ships together, could, um, actually had something like 70 strangers who paid 
a 10 pound fee to go on the voyage. These were not fleeing because of their religious beliefs. They were out to seek their fortune. And um, a, a relatively small portion of them ended up um, eventually traveling. I suspect many of them became disenchanted when they saw how uh, ill-fitted the ships were, particularly the Speedwell, to make the journey. Yeah. So I think a few, quite a few of them dropped out. Um, and I suspect most of those fleeing from religious persecution stuck the course. And as you know, it was a tough course in which 50% died in the first um, terrible winter. So I can't give you more guidance than that, but um, I hope that's helpful. So um, Evelyn asks, and Evelyn, this was a question I had as well, is Wicked Cider, Pilgrim Cider, available in the United States, Randall? I, I don't think so, but you know, I have a home. Um, uh, that's where I've lived for the last 20 years, um, uh, in, in a suburb of Detroit. And when this current health crisis uh, ends, um, I'm going to... Um, uh, seek a partnership with uh, uh, one of these craft breweries um, to have uh, American Wicked Pilgrim Cider. We will look forward to that, Randall. Now, um, speaking of that, um, Grace asks, um, how did you title your book, The Wicked Pilgrim? Well, it was my father's um, comment on um, who he was because he got a, quite a bit of criticism about the way he went about building and raise, particularly raising the money, not the building, I'm sorry, I should have said just raising the money to finance his exercise. Remember, he had no funds himself. He wasn't a man of great wealth at all. Um, and what he did was, among other things, to partner with industry. Now, in those days, the idea of a non-profit exercise um, such as uh, this, this, or uh, it could be a museum or whatever, partnering with industry um, was anathema. It was, you know, many in the press criticized it as dirty commercialism, um, uh, entering um, charitable works. And, um, you know, even his partners were not happy uh, that he, for example, partnered with the American uh, Mayflower Transit Company, who provided phenomenal support um, when Warwick arrived there by distributing these business treasure chests all around the country for exhibition to show Americans the best of British goods. Remember, at this time, Britain was still recovering from the rubble of the Second World War. There were still bomb sites waiting for development. Um, and we needed, um, we needed to build um, new economic partners. So um, he, got a, he got criticized heavily for that. Also, in order to meet his timetable um, of sailing um, for a late May, early June arrival in, in 1957, um, he was encouraged to leave sooner rather than later. And he, there were still some outstanding bills when he set sail in May of 1957. And they were subsequently um, met um, through exhibition fees in um, New York, Miami, and Washington. But at the time, um, you know, the, the media um, were highly critical of that. I mean, he was, he could have waited a year and sailed with, um, because London and Southampton both wanted to have the Mayflower on exhibition before she set sail. But um, he had, you know, people like Senator Kennedy, who became president, um, Senator, uh, Governor Christian Herter, um, uh, not, uh, and, and also the support of President Eisenhower, because uh, Vice President Nixon welcomed the ship. They were all expecting that ship to arrive 
in late May, early June. And my father said, I'm sorry. I mean, my father was a man of action. He said, we'll take care of the expenditure later. And so he, um, he went through a period after arrival of, um, how can I put it, not being um, as, as popular as perhaps he deserved. Uh, but time is a great healer. And he's now seen as having done uh, um, something unique by giving um, a nation that appeared to have everything um, something that they would actually value, which is a piece of their history. So another question about the Mayflower. This is, um, I think, about the original Mayflower. Marilyn asks, um, has the genealogy of the original Mayflower builders been researched? So, um, and I think we're talking about that, the, you know, the original ship there. Right, and that's a very good question. And it, 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 th there's a myth there, and a, um, uh, as well as a misunderstanding uh, behind, not behind the questioner, but behind the, the subject. Um, uh, for example, many people look at Mayflower 2 out in Plymouth Harbor right now, and of the 25 million visitors who walked over it, there's quite a high number. Uh, the guides will tell you, assume it's the original Mayflower. It's not. There were a number of ships called the Mayflower back in the 1600s. The, in those days, you did not have to register the detailed plans of your ship with the Admiralty. And many of the ships were built to a, 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 a standard that was handed on from one craftsman and one boat builder to another. So there were not, there are no detailed plans. And that was the first thing my father found when he went across the, road, uh, the river to Greenwich Museum. Dr. Anderson said, I'm sorry, there are no plans for the original Mayflower. However, we know because ships were built to such a relatively um, similar design, um, what that design will be. And there was, um, this was where he found a great American um, partner um, in uh, a Dr. Baker who um, uh, had spent, uh, he worked, um, uh, for a shipping company and he had his lifetime hobby was researching uh, the design of ships of the 1600s. So my father got that design, but there, there was no design, there is no design as far as I know, uh, exact design of the original Mayflower. They know pretty much what she looked like, but the Mayflower 2 that you see out there is the best guess down to the ink wells in the captain's cabin. And it was, incidentally, when it was built, it was built using the tools of the 1600s, not, not the 1950s. So there was a, 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 as strict as possible um, reliance on histor historical accuracy. And uh, to follow on to that question, Randall, um, the, um, what happened to the original Mayflower after it got back to England? It sailed back in um, 1621. Um, Captain Jones and, the, uh, and those of his crew that survived that first winter. And Captain Jones died shortly thereafter, about um, six months after arrival. And uh, the ship was then pretty ancient. Um, remember, it had been a cargo ship virtually all its life, and it was broken up soon afterwards. And um, I would encourage um, the person who asked that question to go on to uh, voyaging through history, where um, one of the university researchers has produced um, a, a paper or a talk, as I understand it, and it may not be up there yet, but it will be, 
which examines exactly what happened to um, uh, the ship um, after um, Captain Jones died um, and, and where the remains of the ship are. So um, I, th I think we're approaching our time. If anyone has any last questions they would like to ask, um, we can go ahead and um, start um, wrapping up here from Pauline Kieser, our board president, Randall. A big thank you to you for this presentation. And of course, as you mentioned in your talk, um, your support with the Charlton Foundation of helping college students. Um, and that's just um, much, very much appreciated. Um, is there anything um, else you'd like to add at the, as we wrap up this talk? Well, I'd just like to say that um, my father fulfilled most of his um, ambition in, in getting that ship and giving it to built and getting it to America. One thing that he failed to do was that he believed that revenue, surplus revenue from exhibition fees was going to be used to establish uh, Anglo-American scholarships because he was utterly convinced um, that although we were separated by a large ocean, as he said um, um, in his telegram handing it over, um, uh, that will never keep us apart because we share a common culture, as I think we do. And um, certainly my siblings, my family, my sister Vicky and um, my other brothers and sisters who have been involved um, have lived lives where we've, some of, some of my brother Michael is a doctor in um, Chicago. He's the distinguished, one of the distinguished members of our family. Um, my brother Alex um, lives in New York, um, and a sister Caroline and Thea and, 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 and Rachel live in England. My sister lives everywhere. So uh, we're Anglo-American, and um, we think it's a good place to be. Thank you, Randall. And thank you again on behalf of everyone for taking us on this wonderful and fascinating virtual tour. Um, we invite everyone to join us again on October 8th um, for another talk that we're presenting on the history of the fur trade, which was very important to the pilgrims. You can check out the information about that on the website at alden.org. Alden House is open um, as a museum through mid-October for tours. If you're not local, uh, we have virtual tours that you can also register through our website at alden.org. Again, thank you all so much for joining us and please keep in touch. <laughs>